As we continue here on the Exam Room Podcast, brought to you by the Physicians Committee with the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll, I'm really excited about this next segment. It is one that I've really wanted to do for a very, very long time. And now I feel like I have found the perfect guest to bring all of this to the forefront. It is indeed a very, very important issue, one that does not get discussed nearly enough. And so with that, we welcome to the program a public health nutritionist and author and a friend of mine, I will say, Tracy McWhorter. Welcome to the exam room. Thank you, Chuck. It's great to be here. It's great to have you back. It's been, what, a couple of years mm-hmm. since you and your mom were on the show? About two years. Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Since our, our book tour. Yeah. yeah. You are embarking on a campaign called 10,000 Black Vegan Women. Talk to us a little bit about what this program is. Yeah, so 10,000 Black Vegan Women is a movement. It's a program that I came up with to celebrate the 10th anniversary of my first book, which is called By Any Greens Necessary. And that was the... (laughs) And that was the first vegan diet book for black women that came out in 2010 um, and helped thousands of of folks go vegan um, over the last decade, which I'm really proud about. And so for the 10th anniversary, I wanted to commemorate that and do something even bigger. And so um, I came up with the idea of helping 10,000 black women go vegan in one year, something big and bold and necessary. Um, And so that's really how this came about. And um, if folks are interested in going vegan and finding out more about it, um, I welcome them to come join us, come join the movement and and come go vegan with us this year. Uh, Correct me if I'm wrong. uh, The African-American community is actually the fastest growing Mm -hmm. demographic for vegan diets. That's right. You probably saw the article and a lot of your listeners and viewers as well that came out in the Washington Post just a couple of weeks ago saying that um, African-Americans are the fastest growing vegan demographic. About 8% of African-Americans are plant-based, vegan, vegetarian, uh, as compared to 3% overall. Wow. Um, Right. But this this number, so that's, that is um, what the latest Pew study says. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's a Gallup poll that was also mentioned that, sh- that shows that more people of color are vegan and eating plant-based mm. than um, everyone else. This is not surprising to me because of the way that I learned about veganism 33 years ago when I entered into this community. Here's that history part. You ready to go <laughs> right, to school? Here we go. Right into Here we it. go. So I was, um, you know, I went to college at Amherst College in Massachusetts, and my sophomore year, a black student union brought Dick Gregory to campus, and we brought him to talk about the state of black America, and said he talked about the plate of black America and why we should go vegetarian. At that time, vegetarian was the umbrella term, right? Mm -hmm. But he meant vegan. And we didn't know that he had been vegan at that point in 1986 for about 20 years. Wow. Because of the practice of nonviolence during the civil rights movement. He was a right-hand person to Dr. King, and he extended the philosophy of nonviolence to animals, right? And uh, so that talk really rocks my world because up until that point, I really didn't know about food. I didn't know about food and its relationship to social justice, its relationship to health, um, its relationship to so many issues. And uh, I was a really unhealthy eater, not interested in in healthy food despite my mother's best efforts. (laughs) So I took my, my... Uh, sophomore year away the the following year I went to Kenya for the first semester the second semester I came back to DC and went to Howard and when I was walking back and forth to school I discovered that there was this large black vegan community right up the street from Howard and so um, I was floored by this because you know this is literally in my backyard and they had the very first 100 percent vegan establishments in washington dc in the nation's capital Mm. period and there were 12 of them at that time so um this is this is the community that i learned how to be vegan and vegetarian in right so after this lecture from dick gregory i came home and you know, I'm immersing myself and my mother, too, in this community, and we're learning how to cook, how to make it delicious, affordable, the history of it. There has always been a, a big river of black folks who have been pioneering veganism and plant-based food in the movement. Next to this wider ocean of black folks who are omnivores and, and you know, hopefully will be eating 
um, healthier food with, as part of this movement. But um, we've always done it, and we've always been leaders, and it's important to talk about that and for people to know. That's, that's, I, I enter veganism through black culture. Right. Right? People assume that it's a white thing, you know, um, or that this is, uh, this is, we do these things in opposition to or in reaction to when, in fact, we're pioneers in this. What I know from my time as a reporter and what has since been solidified um, in my time now with the Physicians Committee is that in D.C., where the city is broken out into what they call eight different wards, mm-hmm. the health disparities mm-hmm. between the most affluent wards mm-hmm. and the most underserved, underprivileged wards is staggering. I mm-hmm. mean, jaw dropping. Mm-hmm. You're talking about rates of colon cancer, diabetes, like you name it. They are through the roof, you know, say in Ward 8. Mm-hmm. But then you come over here mm-hmm. and it's like almost non-existent. Right. Why because it's that? affluence. You know, this is a, this system, the food system, um, like every other system, you know, that you can that you can name is uh, is based on white supremacist capitalist patriarchy and the people who are most exploited by that are people of color particularly black people particularly black women right so you have impoverishment um you have few resources so wherever there is you know when it when there is a system like that food is going to be affected just like any other system the education system the political system um housing it's the same with food and so ward eight you have the highest uh group of folks who have uh who are low income Mm -hmm. right and so that is going to determine um, what is available to them in terms of what they can buy and what is available available to them to buy, right? Whether their grocery store is there. Um, I mean, it's by design. It's not, there's no surprise. But I also want to say that, um, you know, this community that I was talking about at, near Howard in Northwest, that was a low-income black community mm-hmm. in Northwest. Mm-hmm. So we have been doing these things in low-income black communities. But um, also... Fast food companies in the 1970s began to target African-American cities, African-American communities and urban areas. Um, Before that, African-Americans, after enslavement, growing our own food. And we actually were eating more plants, more fruits and vegetables than uh, white folks were up through the 1960s, even when we moved into cities, we brought this kind of agrarian style food with us. Uh, Fruits and vegetables, grains were the primary foods that folks ate because for economic reasons, right? Right, right. So um, when we started to, when we came to the cities in these low income urban areas, this is when we were targeted in the 70s by fast food. I mean, it was by design that they put these um, fast food places in these low income places rather th- rather than in the suburbs. So we were targeted. And, you know, as this is the result of that, you know, I mean, it's also personal choice, of course. But, you know, we have to understand the systems that are in place that make this so. Right. Well, OK, let's have a let's have a real discussion, uh, yeah. because sitting over here as a white man who has never considered himself to be a white supremacist by any stretch of the imagination. <laughs> it's the system. It, well, OK, it, well, help me understand the system. Help the listeners understand the system, because when you say that, like I'm over here, I'm like feeling both a little bit confused and embarrassed by it. Like, what am I doing to contribute to this that I have no idea I'm mm. even doing? Like, That's a hel- whole help me understand here a little bit. Can you break that down? I can't simply? break that down in like five seconds. <laughs> That's a whole other. I mean, you know, understanding. You understand that this system is set up for white men, and and that's how this country was established, right? Correct. What has changed? How has that changed? Anything that people of color, primarily, and and you know, with me talking about black folks, anything that we have gotten, any laws and amendments, we had to fight for, right? Touche. Right. For sure. It doesn't. It did not change on its own. Food deserts are a huge problem. Mm-hmm. Um, and what I know is that food deserts exist in primarily underserved mm-hmm. areas. Um, I was just out in Arizona, and you want to talk about poverty. I mean, yeah. it is poverty the likes of which you you could not believe on some of these Native American reservations. True. I, I mean, yes. Th- I mean, I was told stories of people having to organize bus trips 
just to go to a grocery store. Mm. I mean, they have these these areas that are the sizes of, of an entire state. Mm-hmm. But there are only two or three regular grocery mm-hmm. stores. And it's so, tragic. It's right, tragic. Right. Yeah. Right. So this isn't the African-American community. But again, you, you're talking about a community that you say was set That's up to a, fail. It's exactly. the same daggone thing. Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, this is th- this is why um, this is an issue of impoverishment as well, you right. know, across the board in this country. And it is it's tragic. It should not be. It right. should not. This should not exist. And, um, you know, it's important to talk about that impoverishment and, and all of the communities affected by that. It's important to talk about the workers who work in factory farms who are exploited. It's important to talk about people who are immigrants who are picking the food that we the fruits and vegetables that we're promoting. Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, there's a there's a whole system in place, um, a food system that needs to be changed, that needs to be improved. Um, so there there are definitely layers to this. Right. Yeah. Let's talk about then. So the obesity rate, Mm -hmm. correct me if I'm wrong. I mean, it's it's an epidemic across the board. Is the obesity rate higher? In absolutely. The okay. Absolutely. And, you know, a lot of people, yes, it is definitely higher. And, and particularly um, among African-American women. And I actually, I mean, obesity is, you know, is a, a medical term. But I actually just say unhealthy weight. Because just because you're thin doesn't mean you're healthy. Doesn't mean you don't have high blood pressure or diabetes or, you know, Great point. heart disease. So I talk about the healthiness the healthfulness of the weight. Um, So when it comes to unhealthy weight, um, African-American women have the worst uh, experiences with that. Mm -hmm. Um, 50% obese, 80% overweight. And so that contributes directly to higher rates of chronic disease, particularly diabetes. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. And Mm -hmm. and is that... uh, you know, the byproduct, I'm assuming the, the obesity rate is the byproduct of the food dev- deserts, the social injustices we've been talking yeah, about, the yeah. lack of access to quality foods, all, all of that. All of that. And, and comfort, you know, and personal choices, but also uh, comfort eating, you know, dealing with, there's there's stress, right? There's We're dealing with a lot of uh, stress from a lot of, um, a lot of reasons, societal reasons, personal reasons, family reasons, um, and... Uh, you know, comf- eating is a is a source of comfort for everyone across the board. Um, and there's also the something called oxidative stress, right? Okay. And oxidative stress, as I'm sure you know, it's it can be caused by external and internal factors, and oh, yeah. it's basically premature rusting of the cells, right? So. Um, you can be stressed from um, things that you're eating. You can also be stressed from um, things that you're dealing with. It, you can, it can be racism. It can be sexism. It can be classism. It can be, you know, anything that's chronic and systematic mm-hmm. and systemic, mm-hmm. right? Um, that can that can wear you down. Right, right. And we know um, that that is one of the co- one of the reasons that African American women have higher mortality, infant mortality rates, um, and it and it plays it's a factor in food as well. For me, the bottom line is most deaths, most most disability and death among African Americans um, are diet re- can be prevented with a healthy diet. Gotcha. Right. right. And so that is the part that we can take back control. We can take back control of, of it all. People are resisting and organizing and always have been. Right on. Um, and while doing that, we must take care of ourselves and we must eat healthier. It's crucial. And so what do you do to kind of begin that conversation, mm-hmm. you know, introduce it to even if it's not a young black woman, just mm-hmm. a black woman. Maybe it's another woman in her 50s, you know. That's right. Maybe like it's your I mom. am now. <laughs> You admit it, but you I'm telling you, like, if you told me you were 35, I'd be like, no question about well, it. Well, we can't, where my work is done. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> leave. So, but, but how, yeah. do you, how do you begin the, that conversation? I, you know what? I, I try to meet folks where I, just have a conversation, meet folks where they are, right? So I, um, because it's my profession, I'm just asking folks, are you interested in eating more plant-based foods? No, are you interested in eating healthier and being healthier? Here is what you can do. Right, right. right? Because nobody wants to be unhealthy. I have yet to meet a mom who wants to raise unhealthy children. I mean, 
you just you know what I mean? Yeah. They just there are there are just lots of reasons why they're not doing it. And so I just want to know what those reasons are. Um, I can't wrap this up without talking about uh, this program here. So we did the soft launch. You did the soft launch here starting this month in February. How's it been going so it's far? It's been going great. We've been at it for about a week and a half, and we already have 1,300 people who have signed up, Ooh. which is fabulous. So, okay. yeah, so the official – so we soft launched it um, – Last week, the official launch will be in May because um, that's when the book, By Any Greens Necessary, came out 10 years ago. Um, so just commemorative of that. And also it gives us a window of, of a few months to get 10,000 folks to sign up. So folks, sign up. <laughs> <laughs> and share it. Share yes, it with your friends. Share it, share it with, with, with your family. It's a, it's a pretty cool program. And a 21-day program, what all is in Right. There? So what's going to happen is starting in May, we're going to have live online 21-day fresh starts. So basically, we're going to go vegan together for 21 days. So folks are going to – so the, the first week will all be preparation. And then the uh, second and third weeks, the, the, the next 14 days, they will have – a meal plan done for you, grocery shopping list, vegan recipes, nutrition tips, and it will be a download PDF. And we'll be, and I'll have cooking videos that we'll be sharing um, on our um, Facebook group page. I'll have Q and A sessions um, with everybody who signed up. So whether we have five thousand, ten thousand, or you know twenty thousand, we're all girl. gonna do it yeah. together. And it'll, and that will happen every twenty-one days through the end of the year. So my, and it's the same program. So. So even if you've done it in May, you can do it again in June. You can keep going with us, and we're just going to be bringing more and more people on board to do it. And um, you know, the goal is just as a as a as a community of folks to just go vegan together and and try to get as many people to try it and do it. Right, right. For as long, you know. As much as possible. Um, but I think this thing is going to take off, you know, just I like do a too. rocket. Like, I do this too. is such a, such a cool, cool thing. Uh, the website, if people want to get involved, what is it? 10,000blackveganwomen.com. The number 10,000blackveganwomen.com. All right. So I'm going to put that out on all of my social media. I know it's all over yours already, uh, but we're going to get that out there. We're going to get you up to uh, 10,000. That's just phenomenal. Thank I you. think that this is such a, such a great concept. Thank you so very much for coming on today. Thank you for having me check always a pleasure thank you if you like that interview and you want more of it go ahead and subscribe to this youtube channel leave a nice comment below and for the full interview also head over to apple podcast and subscribe to the exam room podcast by the physicians committee new episodes with information and inspiration each and every wednesday